Fishing like a local isn't just about catching fish. It's about connecting with the environment and the people who call it home. It's about hearing the stories and traditions that have been passed down for generations and sharing unforgettable moments with the people you meet along the way. Fishing like a local is having an experience that stays with you forever. And with Fishing Booker, you can experience it too, no matter where you are. Discover your next adventure on Fishing Booker. At Midway USA, we know the AR-15 is one of the most popular rifles in modern American history. Known for its modularity and widespread use, it's often considered essential to any gun collection. The essential things you need to run an AR-15 are usually always in stock during shortages, things like magazines and 5.56 ammo. Whether you're looking to buy a new AR-15 or buy parts for your modern sporting rifle, log on and for just about everything for the outdoors, shop MidwayUSA.com. Welcome to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. I'm Matthew of castingacross.com, where I explore the quarry and culture of fly fishing. Well, this is the second episode in a row that I'm recording on site. And by on site, I mean in a car. And I mean in a car in Tyson's Corner, Virginia. So real quick, just setting up why this is happening and why this is significant for today's podcast, this week's episode, is I am taking a class in Tyson's. If you're not sure where Tyson's is, it's about half an hour as the crow flies to the west, kind of northwest of Washington, D.C. in uh, Fairfax County, Virginia. And I'm, again, I'm taking classes here this week. And so on my lunch breaks, I'm heading out and doing all sorts of different things. But I've taken these opportunities to do some casting across work, including the podcast episodes for last week and this week. But this week, episode 191, talking about my fly shop experiences, working at a fly shop. And the reason why it is special, I guess, lowercase s special, is because I'm in the parking lot of uh, Orvis Tyson's Corner. Well, it's kind of creepy to be recording in the parking lot of a fly shop. Well, again, I could be doing it here. I could be doing it at the, the parking lot of my school. But I chose to do it here because I'm across the street from where the fly shop that I worked at 25 years ago used to stand, which was Orvis Tyson's Corner. So as you're probably aware, if you've been fly fishing for any point in time, Orvis is probably the premier fly fishing name in the United States of America and for significant parts of the world. And one of the reasons for that is not just because Orvis has been around for a long time, but they have established a series of company stores across the United States and really across the world. Uh, I've been in some really bizarre places and I've come across uh, Orvis company stores. Uh, And so although lots of different fly shops sell Orvis products, uh, particularly fly fishing products, the Orvis company stores not only sell their fly fishing products, but then also the wide range of home goods and clothing and, and other things like that. Uh, But today I'm not here to talk about Orvis specifically, but Orvis was my first kind of real job. I had a couple of jobs. I worked at my church doing kind of janitorial work when I was a teenager. I worked for an online uh, contact lens company back when the internet was incredibly cumbersome and clunky, and I was in their uh, shipping department. Uh, But then, uh, and I think it was either 99 or 2000, uh, I got a job at Orvis in Tyson's Corner. Now, this store was really cool because it was not a cookie cutter store. If you go to an Orvis store today, there's a very good chance that you will see the exact same thing that in, um, you know, from store to store, city to city, whether it be New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Dallas. I'm not sure if those cities have stores, but they're, they're all going to look basically the same. Uh, but this store back uh, 25 years ago was unique. It was different. It was small. It was cramped. It was dark. But man, we had so many people coming in and buying fly fishing stuff because at that point in time, Loudoun County, which is the county to the northwest of Fairfax County, Fairfax County were exploding. The population was increasing like crazy. And given the nature of the demographics, there was some disposable income to be had. And we're only from where I'm sitting about two hours from the premier waters of Western Maryland, South Central Pennsylvania, Shenandoah, both for trout and for bass, as well as the Chesapeake for striper. So there was all sorts of action locally. And then, of course, with that disposable income, you had people who were traveling all over the country and all over the world. And so in the few years that I worked there, 
I had quite a few remarkable encounters with people, both in the fly fishing industry and in customers, uh, people that I still maintain contact with today uh, that uh, are, are still in fly fishing, people that gave me other opportunities in fly fishing that I met uh, through through Orvis Tyson's Corner. So a lot of fond memories. So the original location is no longer standing. I'm looking at the building right now, which is on the uh, the, the same property that the old uh, Orvis Tyson's Corner was on. It's now like a 27, 28. I counted as I was sitting on a stoplight. Uh, it's a, like a almost 30 story building um, because they took out the uh, the old fly shop, as well as the uh, like the exercise equipment store that was uh, attached to it, and the rug shop. I think there was a rug shop next door, and exercise equipment was upstairs. Um, but it was incredibly difficult to get to, and now it, it would be even harder to get to that spot. Uh, they put in a, um, a metro stop uh, right across the street from the new Silver Line, which comes out of D.C. and into Loudoun County. Eventually, it's going to hook up with Dallas Airport. But that's not what you're interested in hearing. What you're interested in hearing is fly shop experiences and moments. And honestly, I'm kind of surprised I haven't had a, a podcast devoted to these. Now, my experience was limited. And I understand there's guys who have been lifers working at fly shops, which more power to you. It's not an easy way to make money. And it's not an easy way to get through your day. But of course, there are plenty of men and women who this is their life, whether they own a fly shop, or their family owns a fly shop, or this is just their passion, where they've been doing this for countless years. I did it for like two and a half, three years. And I, and from what I gained from that, not only financially, not only from the discounts, uh, but also just from the experiences was huge. So it is, is a great experience. If you have the opportunity, if you're able to swing it, if that works for you, but you're going to encounter some funny things and funny situations. And so I thought I would pass along some of those, uh, uh today for today's podcast as I kind of reminisce and, and think back about my time working at the Orvis store in Tyson's corner. So the first thing I thought of is actually I'm kind of parked next to a dumpster right now. Uh, this isn't really fly fishing related, and this is one of the big punchlines that Orvis often gets, uh, gets to be the, the, the butt of. And that is, you know, you're not necessarily thinking about fly rods with Orvis, you're thinking about dog beds. And that was true. We sold dog beds. And so I learned a lot about dog beds when I was working there. And what's a dog bed? Well, it's a bed for your dog, but they're filled with one of two materials at that point in time. There was some that were kind of like a pillowy material, kind of like the uh, batting, like a stuffing. And then there was these little tiny foam beads, uh, which assumingly was more comfortable for the dog. But it was also a problem uh, when they got loose because, you know, they were covered in static. And so there's always little foam beads back in the stock room stuck to everything because inevitably one of these uh, these dog beds would break loose. Well, Orvis still has a pretty robust uh, warranty policy. Back then, it was even more liberal. And so we had somebody bring in a dog bed and saying that they had just bought it and their tiny little toy poodle just destroyed the thing. And it was in a trash bag in their, uh, the, their, the back of their vehicle. And they wanted to return it. So I talked to the manager and he said, well, of course, we got to return it. So I go to this person's vehicle and there is a urine and feces and hair covered uh, dog bed that's also been torn open by this quote unquote toy poodle. I think it was probably a bull mastiff and he just didn't want to mention that that's, you know, he effectively bought a big chew toy, you know, $200 chew toy at Orvis for their, his dog. And now he was embarrassed and having buyer's remorse. And so I told the, the supervisor, I said, Hey, you know, I don't think we want to bring this in here. It's not hygienic. And he said, okay, just cut off a little piece of it and we'll attach the return tag to it. So we can send it to corporate and, you know, just get all the books straight. So I did that and I said, well, what do you want to do with it now? I said, throw in the dumpster. So, okay. So I carry it out there and I'm, I'm like on a good day, like five, seven and a half. And so I open up this dumpster and it's over my head. I'm like, I'm eye level with, uh, with like the, the lowest point of this angled dumpster. So I open it up and it's one of these dumpsters with a tiny little hole in it, uh, because you know, we're in this very, very public place. So we don't want everybody throwing their trash in this dumpster. And I lift the thing over my head. And as I do the plastic bag, the trash bag catches on something and it tears open. And all I remember was this like movie set moment of all of those tiny little uh, fuzzy balls falling, but they're also covered in all of the dog debris, but they're still staticky. And so they're clinging all over me. So about a third of it gets into the dumpster. The rest of it's on the ground and a good portion of it is on me. 
And so I waited for the guy to leave because for some reason I didn't want him to feel bad, which I probably should have wanted him to feel bad. And I walked back in and spent the next good amount of time picking off those tiny little foam balls and then just counting the moments so I could go home and take a shower. So that may be my most disgusting Orvis memory. Uh, another one, and this was pretty, pretty fun was, uh, the, a guy came in and he's a good regular customer, knew him well. And, uh, he said, he's going up to Alaska for to fish for salmon. And so this was great because we worked on a commission at that point in time. I'm not sure if that's still the case or not. And so he wanted a new pair of waders and boots, something with insulation. You know, he wanted like a, a boot foot wader that has a little bit of more insulation and he wanted a new rod and he wanted a new reel and he wanted two spools, one with floating line, one with sinking line. He wanted them spooled up with backing and with line. Uh, and he wanted a wading jacket, all these things. And so I just walked with him and it was, it, it was fantastic. It was so much fun because he knew what he wanted. So I just, he just said, well, you know, should I get this color or that color? I said, oh, maybe get this color. You know, should I get this line or that line? Oh, maybe get that line. And just walking through with him and, and getting everything picked out was a whole lot of fun. Then the, uh, the really hairy part came. And this was something actually that uh, I, I really appreciate my time at Orvis for, for this reason. Uh, I had to tie knots. So this guy's going to Alaska for his vacation, and he is just confident that because he's getting these guides, uh, he's going to be getting into big fish. So I'm tying bimini twists, and I'm tying you know these really uh, bulky knots to try to make sure backing to line, line to leader uh, is, is nice, smooth transitions. So I'm snipping off the welded loop on the front of his line. Actually, you know, at that point in time, I don't know if there was welded loops on the lines. I don't think there was. Uh, so I'm having to tie nail knots uh, with really heavy duty, uh, but yet supple monofilament, making sure everything is smooth. So it's going to go through the guides well. So all this energy and effort. And he he's a good guy. We had lots of conversations and you know, up to this point, we're having a good conversation now. And I'm almost telling want him to tell me, shut up. Let me focus on this. Don't talk to me while I'm trying to tie these knots. So I tie these knots, ring him up. It was a good day for him. It was a great day for me. He goes on his vacation. About three weeks later, he comes walking in. I've certainly told at least aspects of the story on the podcast before. He comes in and he is just, he, he's beside himself. He said, I always buy Orvis gear and it always does well, but everything I bought fell apart. I'm thinking, how's it mean it fell apart? It's like the rod was fine. The reel was fine, but the line was, it just fell apart. It was, it, it's, you know, the, the core, the, the, the nylon core is showing underneath the fly line and, and my waders leaked and my jacket, when I got rained on it, it leaked, it leaked on my shoulders and he's bringing it in and it's like, it's still wet almost. And I'm looking at it and looking at it. I'm thinking, this is really bizarre. Like how I don't, I can't imagine he would have done this on purpose. This wasn't a situation where he was trying to get his money back. You wouldn't even need to, to, you know, ruin it. You would just ask for it and we would have done it. I'm looking at it, I'm looking at it. And then somebody else that worked there, an older gentleman said, oh, were the bugs bad? And I said, yeah, the bugs were terrible. I said, oh, did you use DEET? He said, oh yeah, I covered myself head to toe every day in DEET, hanging out by the campfire, uh, you know, getting to the float plane on the water, covered head to toe with DEET. And that was the moment, ladies and gentlemen, when I saw firsthand how much DEET can cause degradation of plastics, particularly something like Gore-Tex or the PVC on fly line. Uh, it really did a number on it. it. It made it look almost like it had been melted. And uh, so I think we we were kind to him and we exchanged some stuff, uh, but uh, he, he understood that it was ultimately his fault, not that he did it maliciously, but uh, he wasn't upset. But it was pretty wild to, to see how big of a deal that was in, in, in the graphic uh, demonstration of all these things being laid out in front of me. I want to backtrack a minute to the knots. Um, so we had the line winder, which was awesome, you know, to have a, a line winding device that put things on so smoothly and so uniformly and so quickly that also measured how much backing went on there. It's fantastic. So I've said this before, uh, that's the way to do it. I, I'm really hypocritical in that I will rig up really elaborate contraptions so that I can spool up new reels or new spools with backing in line myself at home. But there is nothing like the efficiency and effectiveness that comes with using a line winding tool. Uh, but again, uh, you're, that means you have to tie your own knots. Uh, but know that if you go to a fly shop, you might get someone like me on on my first day. I remember the first time I had to put like a, a, a bimini twist in someone's bonefish reel thinking, you know, 
if if they if I see them pull up with an angry face, I'm just gonna leave because I know that my bad knot was was the reason that they lost their hundred dollar fly line and whatever large fish pulled all that line out. But that was kind of hairy, and you know, people would then ask for bizarre knots. You think, you know what? I I can tie the what I think and what the good people always think is the best knot. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And and, uh, and if you want to tie something else, then I'm happy to put uh, backing on your reel and then hand you your spool of line and send you on your merry way. So uh, that was great to have to learn how to tie all those knots, kind of in uh, in real time, and. I spent a lot of time doing that and after, you know, fold all the t-shirts, make sure the dog beds were fluffed up, you know, go around and dust light fixtures and things like that. Then go back to the, the kind of tying table slash line spooling station and practice tying knots. And you'd have some dime time here and there, but it was really that focused experience of, I really want this to not just be functional, but to look good because a knot that looks good usually is a knot that is smooth and a knot that is smooth is not going to have any places where there could be a weak point either from it getting snagged on something or from it hitting a, a guide or even just coming loose on its own. And so that was really, really helpful for me to spend time in purposeful, not tying moments. This next experience is certainly something that everybody in, uh, in, a fly shop has probably had at one point in time, but uh, this was even more befuddling because it was at an Orvis store. So, uh, of course, there's the fly fishing section, which for this particular store and for most of them was in the back, and then all the clothing was in the front. And because this store was in outside of Washington, D.C., it was just, again, there were people around here had money, they wanted to buy stuff. It was chock full of, of clothing and fly fishing equipment and accessories and, and anything and everything. There was no open space. Uh, it was, th this store did more volume than even like the New York City store for year after year after year. And so there was just no space in it. So you'd find things in weird places. Well, one of the best things that would happen was that, you know, husband would come in and this is very, you know, stereotypical, but it's stereotypical for a reason because it's true. Husband would come in to buy fly fishing stuff. His wife would come along. She'd find something that she liked and she would want to, to, you know, buy it like a shirt or a blouse or a sweater, which I guess is all the same thing. I remember one day, uh, I'm talking to an older gentleman about, about sunglasses or tools or something like that. And all of a sudden his wife comes back with a sweater and she says, honey, what do you think about this one? And I saw it happening and I realized something wrong is about to happen, but it didn't put two and two together until after it happened. She took that big, fuzzy, pilly sweater that was by design, it was fancy, and she laid it down over the fly bins. So if you've been to a fly shop, most fly shops have those big tables that are, you know, waist to eye level and every fly is in, in you know, there's a couple dozen of them in a bin. Well, she didn't choose the bass flies. She didn't choose the big, bright, thick hooked salmon and steelhead flies. She put it over the trout dries. And it was one of those things where it's kind of like, uh, you know, getting a wound where like, is it wise to, to, to pull the foreign object out? Or should we just leave it in there and uh, wait for a professional to come? So I said, ma'am, just leave the sweater there. And she was so confused. And so I said, just one second. So I picked it up and it could have been a lot worse. Uh, maybe our stock was low, but there was something to the effect of like 50 flies stuck to the sweater. And I remember asking my boss, said, do you want me to take the time? And this was, you know, 25 years ago. So there's barbless hooks, but most of them, particularly in the, in the um, bins, weren't barbless. I said, do you want me to take the time to, to unthread every one of these hooks of every one of these tiny little dry flies with this fine wire hook out of the sweater? Or can I just destroy the sweater? And he said, he was so frustrated by the whole situation. And he said, I'll just, just tear him out of there. So I remember taking forceps, grabbing the hook above the, the bend, after this couple left, of course, and just tearing it. And honestly, the sweater was kind of ugly. It was like brown with like, you know how carpet padding looks? Where it's kind of all the speckly colors. It's, it's tan, but when you look closer, it's like pink and green and orange. That's how the sweater looks. So I don't think that being torn at by a bunch of uh, hooks actually made that big of a difference. But apparently, that sweater was a loss. Well, last story as I, I close up this episode, which I think this has got me thinking. There's plenty more things I could share. I did a lot of uh, fishing journaling back uh, when I was in, in college age. So there's lots of things that have been recorded. These are things that are just top, top of my mind as I was driving through the last few days. Um, but 
we got more calls about live bait than you, you would imagine. Uh, I wouldn't say it was every day, but it was pretty routine. And uh, the uh, one of the bosses, one of the guys in management, he did, he couldn't tolerate it for whatever reason. But it was a completely reasonable you know, question for people to ask, because when you use the yellow pages back in the day and you went to fishing stores, uh, there was only two or three in the area. Um, so as far, I mean, fly shops, again, it was us. And then there was one in like Alexandria and that was really about it, uh, in, in this area. Um, there was some further out and there were smaller things that would be like out of people's basements and whatnot. But, and then as far as fishing stores go, there was a couple of conventional tackle shops, but just not a whole lot around. And so people, well, they go to the yellow pages, go to F, find fishing, and they'd see Orvis. And it had, you know, even the the, the little, you know, two inch by inch and, and three quarters uh, rectangular ad with a picture of fish next to a creel, that old Orvis logo, right? So very reasonable to assume that this is the place that you'd go to catch fish to kill fish. I mean, that's what the marketing was basically telling you. So they called up and they'd ask for you got live bait, you got night crawlers, you got minnows, you got, you know, shiners, whatever. And this, my one boss just gets so irate. Right. No, we don't. We are a fly fishing store. And it's like, oh, heavens, you know, calm down, pal. But I guess he had a lot of stress in his life. Actually, I know he had a lot of stress in his life. But I remember just having lots of fun with it. Well, we don't have minnows, but we have clouser minnows. What's a clouser minnow? Oh, they come in all these different colors. Huh. Okay, you know, are they alive? Oh, no, they've not been alive for a long time. In fact, the deer that we use to create these minnows uh, has, has not been alive for a long time and certainly would have survived the bleaching process. And then, you know, the hello, hello, like usually the prank caller is the one who does the calling, not the one who answers the call. Um, oh, do you guys do you have night crawlers? No, but we have San Juan worms. Oh, San Juan worms. Tell me about a San Juan worm. Well, San Juan worm, uh, they're, they're smaller. They're much more durable than a night crawler, and they actually come with a hook attached to them. Say, really? You know, how much do they cost? Two ninety five each. Two ninety five each? That seems steep for a worm. I said, well, I mean, it isn't alive. It's, it's, it's a dead worm. Why do I want dead worms? I said, well, because we're a fly shop. They said, it was a worm. Yeah, it's a, it's a fly. It's a worm. And conversations like that, and perhaps people thought I was being rude. Perhaps people thought I was being obtuse. But you got to have fun somehow. And again, that last thing, the live bait question, is certainly something that most fly shop employees are, have gotten at one point in time. But you know what's awesome? I know there's fly shops that sell live bait. I think it's great. I think it's excellent because it gets people in door. It gets people to have conversations. And you know what? People are going to get worms. You know what I mean? Buy worms. Uh, people are going to buy worms. People are going to buy minnows some way, shape, or form. Uh, so why not? Why not have uh, have have a little cooler with a couple of those things there and just have that conversation. And most people aren't going to go to your best catch and release stream in the attempts to uh, get all the wild trout using live bait so that they can simply kill them and leave them on the bank. Most people are looking for those things so that they can go to their local pond and catch some bluegill or some bass or some catfish. Uh, so you're, you're actually diversifying your clientele by stocking, whether it be live bait or some conventional gear, uh, precision fly fishing and tackle. I think that's their name, uh, out of, um, South Central Pennsylvania. I think they have locations now in, um, Mount Holly, which is outside of Carlisle, uh, as well as they've got, I think they one in Lancaster and they've got one down. I think they took over a shop in, um, in like Hagerstown area. Uh, but that's just a shop that I follow on social media and they sell conventional gear, power bait and worms and stuff like that. And it's great because guess what? I'm going to do that stuff too. And uh, I'm going to take my kids with me and it gets more people indoor. Anyway, it's a little bit beyond the scope of what I was talking about. So anyway, uh, a couple of quick stories. It's fun for me to sit here. Uh, I'm going to go into the Orvis store here in a second and uh, and check some stuff out. But uh, hopefully this has been entertaining. If you have worked at a fly shop, uh, then uh, then send me some of your experiences. I'd be happy to share those in one of the upcoming podcasts. Uh, and I'll probably do another one like this sometime in the in the near future because there are fun things to share and maybe give you a little bit of perspective of, of what that guy or that woman uh, has to deal with. But like I said, there's people that have been doing this their whole entire lives and they have a wealth of experiences. And if you're just getting started in it, then let me encourage you with this. Record the ridiculous and crazy stuff because it's going to start happening so fast and so frequently that what's crazy is going to become normal and you're going to stop remembering it. And then you're going to be 20 years later wondering, you know, what? I know some weird stuff happened. I just can't remember what it was. So record memories. But that, that happens with fly shop. Yeah, when I 
when I was in social work, I thought that. I'm in ministry, I think that. Um, just with your kids. Uh, anyway, starting to kind of ramble, but I uh, hope you've enjoyed this and that uh, you go to your local fly shop and patronize them soon. This week on castingacross.com, the first article is called Red, White, and Brookies. Red, White, and Brookies. It was the 4th of July, so it's not a very large post. And all I was doing was saying happy 4th of July. So if you're listening to this as it comes out, happy 4th of July. If you're listening to this in January or December, then uh, happy independence because we uh, we hopefully still got it. And that was not a, a cheap thing that we were given. Wednesday's post was called Reddington Butterstick, Staying Gold. Now, the Reddington Butterstick is in its third iteration. There was the original yellow, and then it went to a white model. And now this is the third uh, version of it, and it is back to yellow, but it also boasts some fancy new hardware, as well as a four-piece configuration. I took it for a spin, putting it through the kinds of fishing situations I think any good seven and a half foot four weight fiberglass rod should be able to excel in and that is mountain trout and panfish so i write a little bit about my experience with it specifically how it casts in the two situations that i was kind of talking about one with like small poppers and small streamers and another in casting small dry flies in tighter confines so a uh, short story i love it it's a great rod it's a lot of fun i would say i like it more than the second generation although i don't own a four weight in the second generation generation i have fished that rod before but from my recollection um, of that rod and my experience with the one weight, which I know is a very different rod, but I own the second generation one weight, I feel like this newest version of it uh, is is a little bit better. Uh, and that's not just because it's back to being yellow and it's a four piece. So read more about that on the website today. This week's recommendation is Rio Creek fly line, Rio Creek fly line. So I have written extensively about my love for good fly line in all situations. But one of the situations that I think probably gets the least amount of attention as far as fly line goes is small stream fly line. You're thinking, you know what, I'm just flipping something out there, not needing a lot of distance. Well, the fact of the matter is, if you have a nice fly rod, then you are going to want to maximize its ability to work for you. And a fly line like the Rio Creek fly line uh, is going to do that because it has a very compact front taper and it's going to allow you to load your fly rod even at shorter distances is at that 10 or 15 or 20 foot cast. If you have a normal fly rod, you're probably only getting into the middle of its taper, the belly of its taper at about 20 feet. So the Rio Creek fly line is a great line. I fish at in a three and in a four and I think also in a one weight and uh, it's a great line. I love it. It's become my go-to small stream fly line. It's not inexpensive, but as I've said before, you can take a really good mid-price fly rod and make it a great casting tool with a better fly line. So it's cheaper to go from a good fly line to a great fly line than it is to go from a good fly rod to a great fly rod, if that makes sense. There's articles and, and stuff about that on the website, but I will put a link to Rio's Creek fly line in the show notes of this podcast page at castingcross.com. If you have any questions about lots of small stream uh, fly lines, uh, let me know. I fished quite a few of them that are out there, and I'm happy to share my experience with you. Thanks for listening to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. Please subscribe to your favorite podcast app and rate the podcast on iTunes. Then head over to castingacross.com for three posts a week on the people, places, and things that go into the pursuit of fish. In Wild Country rules were not created by man don't miss wild country wednesdays from 7 to 11 p.m eastern presented by primos speak the language waypoint tv the destination for outdoor entertainment a life that has the stories to back it a life to be proud of it's a Winchester life. Yeah, baby. Six, eight Western. Oh, a mule there, baby, right there. Tune in every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern on Waypoint TV.